Ho, 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 it's mid-December. And what better way of spreading holiday cheer than by talking about the Russian Secret Service installing spyware on its own citizens' phones. That's what this article's about, and today we're gonna be talking about it. We're gonna talk about what happened, what the malware is, and how you can better protect yourself against a situation like this. So the article kicks off with after a Russian programmer was detained by Russia's Federal Secret Service for 15 days and his phone confiscated, it was discovered that a new spyware was secretly installed on his device upon its return. The programmer was Kirill Parubets, if I didn't butcher that, and he was arrested by the FSB after being accused for donating to Ukraine. After regaining access to his mobile device, the programmer suspected it was tampered with, especially after it exhibited unusual behavior and seeing notifications stating ARM Cortex VX3 synchronization. Now I'd like to preface that I am no phone security expert, but as you'll see as we continue in this article, there are many giveaways and artifacts that can be seen that any security savvy person could recognize and realize that, that this could be a security incident. So after spotting this unusual behavior, the programmer decides to hand over his phone to a citizen lab for forensic analysis. And I did not know who citizen lab was before reading this article, but they are a research lab that studies information controls that impact the openness and the security of the internet and that pose threats to human rights. So basically they're a research lab in Toronto that does a mixture of human rights and cybersecurity. It looks like down here they're known for investigating the use of the NSO group's Pegasus spyware on journalists, politicians, and human rights advocates. So that's pretty big. So Citizen Lab takes this guy's phone and the investigators confirm that spyware has been installed on the device and it was impersonating a legitimate Android app called Cube Call Recorder. And not knowing what Cube Call Recorder was, I looked it up and it looks like it's an app that's used to record phone calls and VoIP conversations. So definitely a good app to pretend to be spyware if the programmer already had it installed on his phone because it already is supposed to have permissions to record audio and other permissions that the spyware would want to have. And this app impersonation seems to be like a very common and effective way for adversaries to install malware on mobile devices, especially in an Android environment where the installation of applications isn't as locked down. When it comes to mobile device malware in these security articles and on the news, it seems that these Trojan horses have been the most prevalent and talked about of all of the mobile phone incidents. Back to our news article though, we have a nice chart that shows the permissions granted to the Trojanized app or the fake spyware app compared to the legitimate cube call recorder. So we see that both the spyware app and the legitimate app have access to the user's location when the app is open, the ability to record phone calls like we mentioned earlier, and gathering information about the target's contacts. But the spyware app also has a ton of other extra permissions that the original app did not, including accessing GPS information when the app is not in use, being able to read and send iMessages or SMS messages, being able to install additional packages and other malware, recording calendar entries, recording screen captures, being able to answer phone calls, and record video from the device's camera. So pretty much all of the permissions you would want to have in a piece of spyware. Citizen Lab later reports that the malware appears to be a newer version of Monocle, which was first discovered by Lookout in 2019. So if we want to learn more about Monocle, we can take a look at it on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And if you don't know what MITRE ATT&CK is, it's a framework that lists all of the tactics, techniques, and procedures of a whole bunch of advanced persistent threats and other malicious actors. So it's a great tool for gathering cyber threat intelligence or for trying to reenact a specific threat actor in a red team test or a penetration test. So the description for Monocle on MITRE ATT&CK says it's a targeted sophisticated mobile surveillance wear developed for Android, but there are some code artifacts that suggest that an iOS version may be in development. And like the article says, it was developed in September 4th, 2019. And if we scroll down, we can see all the different techniques used by Monocle, including being able to research set a user's password or PIN, being able to capture audio or control phone calls, which we saw in the article. We see that there's the ability for key logging and screen capture, and a whole bunch of different techniques for network discovery. So this article points out that this new version of Monocle, this new spyware, has some different capabilities as well. So apart from the ones we've already mentioned, we have being able to execute shell commands and decrypt data, being able to perform key logging to capture sensitive data and passwords, like what we saw on the MITRE ATT&CK framework, executing shell commands and installing APKs or Android packages, as well as being able to extract passwords from the device and other files from the device as well. Another thing to point out is that this malware uses an encrypted two-stage process. So there are two different kinds of delivery methods for malware, which are staged and stageless. Stageless basically means that the entire malware payload gets installed all at once, and staged, which is what was used here, is where only a portion of the malware called the stager gets installed at the point of compromise, and that stager will later install the rest of the malware. And the reason for that is breaking up the malware payload 
into multiple stages makes it a little bit harder to detect on the incident response side. As well as having proper signatures that detect the malware from an anti-malware program. The spyware's functionality also includes encrypted files with seemingly random names to complicate detection. Using the different random file names complicates detection by leaving behind different indicators of compromise and artifacts. So if a known piece of malware like Monocle is known to leave behind specific files or other artifacts that always have a the same name then security analysts and researchers could develop rules and other detection methods for those indicators of compromise and artifacts but if you use random names then there's not that piece that you can use to detect the malware on and then you have to rely on methods like behavior analysis to actually detect the malware instead of hard-coded names of files and other artifacts the analyst also reports finding references to ios in the spyware's code which points to the possibility of a variant that runs on Apple iPhone devices. So again, we saw this in the MITRE ATT&CK framework in the description of Monocle that there's uh, code artifacts that suggest an iOS version is in development. So this kind of further supports the theory that this new spyware is actually just a copy of Monocle and was modified a little bit to evade detection. So towards the end of the article here, we get a few handy tips written by the author of the article. If you're ever in a situation like this, people who have their device confiscated by law enforcement and later returned should switch to another device or hand it over to experts for analysis. It would be ignorant to think that something like this couldn't happen in the United States. You know, if history is anything to go off of, we all know of the Snowden situation and the US alphabet agencies will do everything that they can to get the information that they need. So these tips really only apply to things like whistleblowers, but if you have a second device, you should be using that after you've been detained and your device has been confiscated. And having the ability to hand over your device for forensic analysis by an organization like Citizen Lab or another research organization is definitely a great idea to see if your phone's been tampered with in any way. Those living in oppressive countries should consider using burner devices when outside and at risk of arbitrary arrests. Use anti-spyware mechanisms like Apple Lockdown Mode and keep the OS and apps up to date. So Apple Lockdown Mode is pretty interesting. Again, this is something I didn't realize existed before this article, but according to this support article by Apple, lockdown mode is an optional extreme protection that's designed for the very few individuals who, because of who they are and what they do, might be personally targeted by some of the most sophisticated digital threats. So again, things like whistleblowers. When lockdown mode is enabled, your device won't function like it typically does. To reduce the attack surface that potentially could be exploited by highly targeted mercenary spyware, certain apps, websites, and features are strictly limited for security and some experiences might not be available at all. So anyone can turn on lockdown mode in the settings of their iPhone, and it will affect things like blocking specific attachment types on iMessage, including certain types of image, video, and audio. It will block complex web technologies when you're browsing the web. It will also block any incoming FaceTime calls unless you've previously called that person, as well as do things like strip location information from your photo when you share them, disable the ability to automatically join non-secure Wi-Fi networks, and also disable the ability to be enrolled in mobile device management software. So again, all of these are extreme protection methods that really only need to be used by specific individuals like whistleblowers that need to protect themselves. So not necessary for the average person, but it's nice to know that it is an option. And that last little bit that is quick, but probably the most important, is keeping your OS and apps up to date. That is to prevent any recent vulnerabilities from affecting your device. I know updating your phone and your laptop and your devices is a pain, but it's necessary to prevent exploits and recently discovered zero days from affecting your devices and being able to install things like the Monocle spyware or other malware onto your devices. All right, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed, feel free to give me a like and subscribe for more cybersecurity content. Make sure you join my Discord if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.